I am, sort of. Okay. Hi, I'm Robert Jacobson. We're uh, multiple hats. Um, I'm a principal of the uh, Space Angels Network, which we're going to talk about here today, the LA Southern California chapter. And we're the first uh, professionally managed angel group focused on aerospace related investment. So it's not all strictly space, it's not all strictly the air, but it's um, anything related to that. So does everybody just as, as base, does everybody know what an angel group is or have any, have any interactions with one? I, I see a potential member. Richard, you're, you're, you're definitely an angel. So angel, so angels are tend to be um, individuals who take their hard-earned money and they invest in usually uh, risky startups. You know, you usually hear it's from off like internet companies, but it can be for aerospace as well. Uh, typically, it might be anywhere from maybe twenty-five thousand up to maybe a million dollars, and you know they're putting their money at risk, and they're usually sometimes the first investors after maybe say your your rich uncle if you're lucky enough to have one, or you know other family members who might invest in your your startup. So. The idea with the angel, with an angel group is that we bring a consolidation of, of of other angel investors. Typically, they have experience in investing in other deals, and they invest together. They don't buy choice in, in deals. So usually, the the angel groups that typically are around are usually geographically based. Sometimes they're, they'll have an industry focus. So the challenge with uh, Space Angels Network is that we found that you know the deals and the, the business plans that are coming through are are they're they're not just from Southern California. They might be uh, you know companies that we have a company that's coming from Seattle, Laser Motive, that's basically made an invincible extension cord. Um, they're beating power, and it's, it's not space based power at this point, but they're from like a a flying platform. And um, so you have uh, groups in the Bay Area near uh, NASA Ames. There's quite a, a center um, of startup activity. Uh, Boston, we've had a, a company that's just applied that is doing, uh, they're basically taking, they're creating electricity with a, uh, a dirigible, taking wind currents, traveling through, turning a turbine, and creating electricity. Pretty exciting stuff. So what we're doing is we're, we're a pipeline. We, Groups, entrepreneurs in, uh, apply online through an online platform that we call AngelSoft, and we help filter that. And hopefully, you know, there's always a few, uh, uh, I'll call it a few really too outlandish to be credible, but, you know, we can still accept just about anybody. And then we connect them with uh, our investor network. Um, so some of the plans are strictly business plans that have not yet been. Uh, uh, had sorry R and D have been vetted a lot of ways, and then we've had other companies like Maston Space, which I think is represented here today, Xcore, um, Laser Motive, who I've mentioned, um, come through and, and and be you know be a potential target opportunity for an angel investor. So the great part about it is you get to connect with other if you're a, an if you're an investor member you get to. To connect with a, a group of investors, include people like Esther Dyson, who's a pretty well-known tech investor, uh, Ed Tuck, who uh, was a Pasadena-based well-known angel, um, and so there's both a sort of social experience about it, a feel-good experience that you're helping enable uh, future aerospace, uh, hopefully highly profitable opportunities, and hopefully one day you will get a return on your investment there when they have some type of financial exit. Um, Rich here can probably even tell. Rich, which, what are some of the companies that you, you've invested in as an angel? Oh, let's see. Uh, years ago, uh, I can probably only remember the profitable ones, <laughs> 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 which are, it's a bit of a percentage game. You know, you want to uh, uh, save enough of your resources to distribute them. But uh, Comag was, uh, was one that did uh, fairly well up in Silicon Valley. It was one of the pioneers in that space, but uh, uh, memory uh, disks, when I realized how small you could make the uh, magnetic group on there, I wrote a check instantly. And then I guess without taking a lot of your time, uh, one of my most recent ones is uh, 
a little bit in Perifugia. That's a, uh, an airplane, a uh, rotable airplane. And uh, I don't know how active it is lately. I'm a fairly passive inventor in uh, the rocket racing league. Uh, hopefully that might get some traction. Probably enough time, Robert. So that so yeah, Richard and hopefully will be a an active member of Space Angels Network at some point. So we have uh, periodic meetings here in Southern California, and um, if you're an entrepreneur, um, you should definitely take a look at spaceangelsnetwork.com, which is um, a good place to get information about it. We also have a chapter in the Palo Alto area near Ames, and uh, one of my colleagues, Amrash Kalapara, he runs that chapter. Uh, Joe Landon is sort of the the chief instigator of the operation is based out of Atlanta, but he's frequently on the West Coast. Um, are there any are, are any of you entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs at this point, or have had some type of? Okay, Ron. Both guys a little hesitant there. Come on, it's like. <laughs> I think there comes a point with in, in your career where you realize that the, the, the happiest you can be in your job is if you're you're your own commander, you know, if, uh, if you're you're in charge of, of what you're doing. And uh, I, I think there's some of my friends anyway, and including myself, that think hey, the, the way to go is just to, to have your own business. So an in, in angel and they're investing in that they, they they understand that. So but. Investor, they're they're looking, you know, they're looking into the financial return, and they want to make sure when you say you have what are your widget that you're trying to sell, it's not really all about me. I mean, they want to find out how quickly you can be replaceable, and they're looking for things like scale. You don't tell them that, you know, I am I. It's purely all about me because they don't want to see you get, you know, God forbid, hit by a bus or, or something like that, and and their their investment goes uh, proverbially down the drain. Um, sure. Well, let, let's talk business models. I mean. The the ones that you hear about are like space, you know, for a company to become profitable. Space, so space tourism is one business model you hear of, and another one is government contracts. What other business models might space startups have? Um, some recent ones that we've seen through there was a, a group um, that was that was attempting to do some stuff with na nanosat, so nanosat small satellites. Um, that there seems to be some gate traction getting in that area. Um, I think looking at so commercial companies, commercial companies, I think. Yeah. And energy might be related, even though it's, you might not think of that as directly related to uh, to uh, space flight or aerospace. Uh, like we have this company, they literally have this this floating dirigible, it's on a tether, and there's a turbine in it, and I think it sits about maybe a thousand meters, something like that, and then there's, um, and then the wind comes in one end, high altitude, altitude balloon, you know, yeah. so aerospace. I mean, we look at stuff that's like, Terrafugia has come through um, Space Angels Network, which is this rotable airplane that's been on the news recently because I think they scored a exemption from the Department of Transportation. Yeah, it's, like it's legally an off. I guess this is literally true. It's an off-road vehicle. <laughs> an off-road vehicle, yeah. literally. Okay, I like that. Literally an off-road vehicle. Charles is actually talking about uh, making deliveries at tail end of next year. So. Of the vehicle with customers. Sure thing. Yeah, I would say that you know, aside from your businesses, what you can do is you can sort of analyze the supply chain that's developing around new space. So, for instance, there's uh, space flight services that are providing kind of travel agent type uh, uh, connection between people that have the nodes and uh, launch vehicles. They're not, you know, I'm not. They're not building rockets. They're not building doing rockets. logistics type of work. Yeah. And, 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 and so anything that's, I mean, what's happening in, in new space is the development of an infrastructure. And one can think as an entrepreneur of, gee, what's the supply chain within that infrastructure? And then how can I uh, fit in within that? And you mentioned small satellites. I'm going to give a session about thinking about uh, nano racks. But you know, nano racks is a service that delivers payloads to the ISS. And you can think about what is the technology that would serve those customers that are part of the nanoracks pool. They have a list of people that are flying. And there are a lot of technologies that, that are, they don't have on the ISF that you might need for research and development or you know, for manufacturing. So. <laughs> I mean, so far, consulting analysis side is also a possibility. Yeah, but that's not necessarily the type of business that's sort of saying angels, 
like when they're looking sort of say like internet companies. I mean, they're looking for things that you know, quick. At, you know, I mean, they're looking to get out of it pretty quickly. You know, you know, under a couple, I mean, two, three years. Um, they want something to. You know, I mean, they're really looking for scale. They might be looking at you know 20, 30 times on their, uh, uh, ideally on their money. And that's why they usually, if if they can, like Richard was saying. Uh, they basically save their resources so they can maybe make a portfolio of investments, whether it's five or 40 investments, and whether you're make, investing at $5,000 or $200,000, um, because it's a little bit, you know, it's like venture capital or being a, a record label uh, operator, where they know most of, the, most of them are not going to be successful or they're not going to have a high rates of return, but one is going to pay for all the you know, losers. Um, I, I don't like want to use that word, but that's that's kind of how they they look at it. So conversations with um, uh, angels. I think uh, my friend Alex here. He's had he's had experience there in, in the world of uh, you know, raising capital, and um, um, you know they, they are interested in return. So as much as, as you know, you you're passionate about your dream or whatever the, the business might be. I mean, ultimately, the, you know, they're providing that lubrication to make your to make you go for at least a little while because you end up having to raise further rounds of capital if, especially if you're you know you have your your whatever it might be um, take mass mass and I think he, he's he's constantly raising money I'm sure he's if he's really ever finished um, until they have their maybe their IPO or they get acquired by say uh, maybe a, uh, one of the larger companies like that North of Grumman did with uh, scale Look, the pattern of the successful companies? Uh, you know, the aerospace, I don't think, has had uh, sort of returns like uh, like maybe we've seen in some of the other tech sector, but, you know, a lot of people are involved with this. It's more than just the, you know, tangible returns. They're looking at what they can, what they're, they're investing in, you know, long-term technology development to, you know, it help. Like SpaceX launch vehicles would take, you know, tremendously long time scale and, you know, money. Well, I can't speak for SpaceX, but they've already launched something. I mean, they've already, they've already. I mean, if you were an entrepreneur looking for a place to get in, like it seems that would be a more difficult. It, it, it is. It's uh, a little more difficult in this business than, in, say, something like pharmaceuticals. In fact, software and pharmaceuticals are the way a bigger majority of venture. They should buy on for that. A bit about that. About like well, venture capital or yeah. uh, the difference. I mean, so you have like so so the stages, you know. So you maybe have these, you know, uh, you know, friends and family round, and then angels, which might be the individuals, and then they want to find a way to exit their investment, and then usually it doesn't always happen from a first round of venture capital, like a you know an A round or B round. It could, um, but. So basically, the venture capitalists come in and they look at. Uh, so you invest. Uh, say, say I. You say you're the entrepreneur. I'm going to put in a hundred thousand dollars to your. You, you feel the business is worth a hundred thousand dollars. So now, once I put a hundred thousand, becomes a post value of two hundred thousand dollars. And then, say a year or two later, the venture capitalist looks and they see you've got a little bit of revenue and look and they and they kind of go back and forth with the entrepreneur and sort of say, now we think you're going to be worth, you know, a million dollars and we're going to, you know, so they, so it's, it's kind of a, um, it's a tug of war because the investors, whether they're venture capital, more professional investors or angels, they're looking for bargains too. It's not, they, they might see a business they really love, but if the entrepreneur is not really willing to budge on valuations and all the other sticking points, there's other opportunities They you know, you, they tend to not get a, emotionally attached, but it is a little bit like dating. <laughs> yeah, the, the venture guys are generally looking for even a quicker exit, and they're probably pretty, be pretty active in, in the management of one board seat. But well, I, I've been through that. I'm not as an entrepreneur, but working in startups, I mean, I've seen a lot of that. The you know, amount of control of some VCs do. Get rid of the founders at some point is often common. And <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, but from my standpoint, the value added for angels from the investor is what Robert mentioned. You kind of get a screening and you kind of get a, a little more formal process of finding entrepreneurs. And from the entrepreneur standpoint, the value added is uh, 
takes a, a lot of skill sets to kind of come up with a business plan and come up with a strategy and uh, generally the angels will help you do that. So and they can be helpful in recruitment, yeah. they can um, introductions, introductions. Um, sometimes they'll take a, um, uh, you know, a position on the board. Um, uh, a well-known one in the space community. Uh, I don't think he's here today, but Lee Valentine, if you ever want to speak to somebody who's really active, uh, he's on the board of a couple different companies, including uh, Orbital Outfitters, X-Core Aerospace, and he's a full-time uh, ER doctor, and then um, he probably drives up to Mohawk. I mean, he's, he moved out from the East Coast to be closer to his one of his main investments, which was x -Core. And he spends time actually out there in the shop, seeing metal being bent, um, because you know he has a lot of his. Uh, he's got, as they say, skin in the game. Um, and not every not every other investor has that sort of time or uh, you know resources to do that. But um, but back to the sort of you know bringing back to sort of Space Angels Network. Our goal is to find great people to make. It's not we're, we don't get com we're not getting commissions when we're matchmaking at this point it's a, a mostly a, a voluntary work that we're doing but we're trying to find uh, you know interested and hopefully uh, valuable investors because you know their, their their time and their insight their wisdom that they've had through uh, their business experiences in the world is is really helpful to entrepreneurs some who've had different levels of uh, success in their own right and making those uh, bringing those resources together so that we can really, in the long term, do all the cool, amazing things that we want to do. I don't really want to sit talk about raising money and that sort of thing. There's just all this really amazing stuff that you know we heard uh, John and Alex alluded to earlier, and my friend Nicola was talking about a, a quick trip to Mars. That's the really the stuff that I think everybody really wants. Dollars, to do. <laughs> <laughs> Take in, the scheme, in the grand but, scheme of things, but, $5 billion isn't that much. Well, no, Look at what we got million. from $750 billion of TARP money. Look and at what we got from well, $600 no, no, billion. What about our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq? What type of return have we got? $4 trillion dollars each. Goldman Sachs is more well connected than so. But we're not supposed to probably talk about politics here too much. Try to keep it so related to uh, Space Angels Network. But anyways. No, my point is just that $5 billion is not that much. No, the trip that uh, the Juno trip that the, the launch that happened yesterday to Jupiter, I think was at 1.1, and it's gonna. Right. I mean, it's gonna be. I mean, look what Hubble did. I don't know what any idea what Hubble costs. I I don't know, but it's an amazing. It's not just a return on investment; it's a return on imagination. More than what? More than two billion. That's probably not a whole lot for the amount of the the, re, the return on inspiration that we're getting, right? I, so I, I feel the same way about space. It's just a my own personal belief, but. Um, I mean, many of the uh, the principles at Space Angels Network were were involved to uh, to really help kickstart and um, and be catalysts for um, for entrepreneurs um, who will do great stuff in this, in this industry. So I hope you all will check out Space Angels Network. We have events in uh, Palo Alto. We're going to be doing something in Seattle, L.A. We do things fairly regularly in, in uh, Los Angeles. We're going to be doing an event at a restaurant in Santa Monica on Wednesday, August 17th. So if you want to know which restaurant, you have to email us or register on the website. <laughs> we, want, we are not going to charge for this event, um, but we're going to be sending out an invite on Monday. So go to spaceangelsnetwork.com, get on the mailing list. For you people who will be watching this archived, you know, we can definitely use more um, you know, volunteer support if those of you are interested in uh, helping out prospective members and entrepreneurs you know I think it's pretty it's about a hundred bucks to apply and that's it so um, and we try to do be as helpful as we can to uh, uh, connect the right business plans with the with the best investors as possible and we've got a few other like Zach you're working on something sure uh, we are developing technology right now for solutions to space debris and looking specifically at Leo uh, as the first place to uh, test our uh, systems design but you haven't applied to Space Angels Network yet. I'm calling you out on that. Um, well, we look forward to the time when Space Angels returns. I think there was an event, uh, unfortunately, was canceled a short while ago, which we definitely look forward My to. Fault. That. That's okay. <laughs> 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 we, I look forward to attending that event, absolutely. Great, okay, excellent. So, um, 
Any other sort of questions or comments regarding the space? Alex? Is there any list of the highest return investments related to space at the macro level? There has not been a list, but I think... This is the project, this is the expected amount of total return, and this is how much it would cost estimated to achieve it. I mean, conjectures like space elevator and space-based solar power are two, and maybe lunar mining or leveraging those? Right. But a list that says the best estimate... No, no, but there's not been a list or study. It would be good... I would like to see one that uses available resources now, not some type of what they call unobtainium or something like... If we could just put me on the moon here with my Caterpillar vehicle, and I would just do a little dredging here, I'd be able to send back some nice lunar ore. But I think there's a few people in the room that are going to be people that are going to make this stuff happen. I can sort of look around, and I know a few of you personally through the work here, and I think that we're seeing the future doers here. Can I ask a follow-up question? Absolutely. Is there any kind of an ROI from money we put into space so far? On anything, an investment made in space and a return on that investment? We're sitting here, or it's... That's not a return on investment. You said return on imagination. No, no, no. He meant a return on investment. He said about dollars. I'll give you one stat that I came up with. The federal government put $50 million into the internet between 1968 and 1983. The federal government of the United States gets an extra $500 billion a year in revenue indirectly because of that investment in the internet. That's a million percent return a year, every year. That's an incredible investment. It's got to be comparable if you go back to Apollo. Right. That's what I'm wondering. Has anyone done those calculations? Iridium, I think, is a good example. I think there was a paper written comparing the Hoover Dam project and Apollo, which was interesting, talking about the similarities between the two. When was Hoover Dam built? The 30s? Yeah, 32. It was a WPA type of project, and yet it's still in operation today, and they were looking at the investment of Apollo. But at the conclusion, there wasn't a lot of dollars put to it, but they sort of concluded that, yes, we're still getting a return from the investment in the Apollo program, as well as similarly like Hoover. But I could look for that. Well, I just think that in this room, out of this whole conference, this is the most money-oriented, and everything will come out of somebody hearing the possibility of putting money in, because certain people will put a percentage of their portfolio into things that have a future return. Like we have Google here. So Google puts solar panels on its roof, then put charging things in its parking lot, then it has their G Fleet electric cars, and they put $270 million into a fund for solar. So they have four elements that actually pave the way for the world to go more solar. And Google, at some point, can release an ROI and say, look, we got a good ROI. But what you're indirectly touching on, Alex, is that you're saying it was a maybe publicly listed company, but a private entity using whether or not they see a return on investment. They could basically be doing the Google or Nextprize for purely for whatever internal reasons, and that's not going to make them any money. But that's their right. There's this discussion of whether the government should be investing in the space program or to what degree, or is it really the marketplace that should be picking and choosing. I think that's sort of what we're looking at, is we're sort of saying getting more private investors to actually look at a variety of space, whether it's space-based solar power. And at this point, there's really not that many individuals, and there's almost no institutional capital, with the exception right now of maybe SpaceX, and maybe whatever pension funds are investing in defense-oriented stocks that are really interested in this. I mean, at this point, you talk to the Clearstones, whoever else, they're still looking at what's the coolest Twitter app and social networking connectivity. Is that really the high technology that is going to move the United States and the world forward because of the original investments that we had in Apollo or what DARPA did with the intranet, right? So, Robert, whatever you mentioned earlier on with the micro-satellite, I believe it's AV Environment. So they're making micro-satellites for the Air Force or the Army. So it would be nice if you guys can 
connect some part of the government who actually have bigger funding and to justify the need. And, you know, I don't know how exactly it works, but uh, historically, isn't all the space program is driven by Cold War? You know, it's, it's it was, but I think we're just hitting that paradigm shift where we're realizing it's not always being at the, excuse my French, the government nipple, but actually looking for real risk money. And when it's your money and not necessarily taxpayer money, I will bet you that the money will be more efficiently deployed and, um, and not all of those investments will pan out, but I, I'm a firm believer that you have to allow a, a certain amount of the, uh, the market and private money to decide what is the, uh, uh, the best connectivity with those resources, best deployment of them, and utilization of them, and, and hopefully advancements of technology that will benefit the rest of society. Because the way we see it is that the high ground space is not just a destination, but it's an enabler. And that's what we're really trying to do is allow space to, en to enable, whether it's for uh, creative access, communication access, resource access, but it's really thinking about all the stuff as an enabler. So I don't want to, I want to be respectful of the time, but uh, thank you very much and for listening and sharing today. And I'm Robert Jacobson. Like certain kinds of investment, like let's say um, 
the OTC, bulletin board company. And that's because they shorted. Over 3,000 companies went out of business because they were shorted. There was not one investigation of the SEC. So the SEC is... It's, it's, Paper, it's, tiger, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's, it's basically a tool like the yeah. tax. Can I look at start the oh, sure. Just a second. You guys don't mind. <laughs> great discussion, by the way, guys. It's, it's really like the great. tax office with all the You can use the tax system. There's, I don't think, I think there's some that's good for like 85% of people. Have some so if you guys want to have a seat, I'm going to go ahead and explain uh, what this program is. How are you guys doing today? Great. All right. This is called NASA's Eyes on the Solar System. And first of all, I'm Jared Head. I'm an activity specialist here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. And we're always trying to figure out ways to teach kids how to uh, actually relate to these missions that are happening that NASA's doing. And uh, it was really great last night. We had a uh, stargazing night here. And I was able to use this, and we were talking about the Juno mission to Jupiter, which just launched yesterday. And I had a lady uh, sitting right about right there, and she had no idea that NASA was still running. They thought after the shuttle mission, NASA had shut down completely, and that, uh, <laughs> that they were all done. But there's actually still all these great robotic missions that are going on, and we want to tell kids and adults that may not know about it how to do that. So this is a program developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I don't work for JPL. But I got to see this demonstrated at the NASA Tweet Up, and it is a great uh, little program that they have available to everybody. So it's at, I got the URL right here. It is at solarsystem.nasa.gov slash eyes. And what it basically is, is it's a 3D visualization program where we can go out into the solar system and we can actually look at it in 3D. So you go to the website, you can run it in your browser, I'm running it in Google Chrome right now, and we can actually look at that. So you'll have to download what's called the Unity Web Player first, and that's a quick download and you'll plug it in instantly and you'll be able to run. So I'm actually going to open it up now, and we are going to look at the Juno mission to Jupiter here, so it will take a little while to load. It's a great program that they're still constantly working on. They're always updating it with new models of spacecraft that are in our solar system. And this is mostly NASA and JPL missions that they have. They also have a couple of ESA missions and a few of the uh, uh, JAXA missions as well. But these aren't human missions, they're all robotic missions. And it's going to load again. And it allows you actually to travel through time in. Uh, in our solar system's exploration. So we can go all the way back in time to uh, Pioneer 10 and 11 and look at that. And then we can go all the way up to the future as well. Uh, one of these has Mars Science Laboratory uh, in it once you get to that point. OK, so now we're waiting for initialization. Technology is an amazing thing. It teaches you patience. So here's our solar system. And it's going to load. So there's our sun in the middle right there. And there is Juno, where it's at currently. And we're still waiting on this connection to load. It's also got Vesta there as well. You can see where Vesta is at. I'm going to adjust some things. You can actually adjust the visual controls on this. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the brightness of the stars so that we can see it on this. And we can change around a couple things, and we'll talk about these visual controls in a little bit. So here is our inner solar system, a bit incomplete because we're still waiting for Earth. Oh, there's Earth, there's Venus, there's Mars. So let's go ahead and go look at Juno. So one of the cool things that I can do in this is I can actually look at the solar system in three dimensions. So I can look around and I can see everything. I can zoom out if I want to. Here's the whole solar system with all of our planets <coughs> all the way out to Neptune there. And we can see some of those uh, probes are still out there. There's Voyager 2. We have to go out a little bit further to see Voyager 1, where it's at. But let's go ahead and go in and let's look at Juno since it came up, uh, since it launched yesterday. And it's actually going to zoom into Juno. And what's really cool is that we're actually looking at this in real time right now. So it's going to download telemetry data from Juno and it's actually going to show us what Juno is doing at this moment as it's heading out. And as it's downloading that, we can go ahead and I like to, or, I like to orient it so that you can look back at Earth and see how far away it is from Earth. Although sometimes it can be a little difficult to find planets. Oh, there's Earth right there in the background. And here's Juno. And this is what Juno is doing right now. 
This is what Juno is at. This is the point of attack in space. It's rotating like that. That is, if you were flying along with Juno, this is what Juno would look like right now. And you can actually see it. So we can see that Juno's got those three huge solar panels on it. You can see the front of it. It's got the high gain antenna. And we can even zoom in all the way and we can look at some of the instruments that are on it. We can go to the back end. We can see it's propulsion engine in the back, some of those instruments in there in the back as well. I'm going to uh, modify this a little bit so you can see it a bit easier. So we can actually turn it on so that everything is lit up. And we can see the back end of Juno a little bit better. So it's facing the sun right now, obviously giving its energy from those huge solar panels on its way there. So we can also compare it to the size of different objects. So somebody asked me last night how big Juno was. I said we can compare it to the size of a scientist. There's a scientist flying along with Juno. Of course, that wouldn't be good if you were standing right there. She has a space suit. And we can also take a car, the Porsche here, old school Porsche. And you can take that to Jupiter with you as well. And then also because JPL is based out of Pasadena, they decided to put the uh, Rose Bowl in it as well. That takes a little bit longer to load because it's a little bit bigger. So there's the Rose Bowl flying along in space. There's Juno over there with it. So we can close that back out and we can go back to Juno. And we can move time, like I was talking about. We can actually go forward in time here. So now we're seeing it as it's going around in its orbit. We could also go back in time. So we could watch Juno go back to Earth. Possibly it doesn't want to go to Jupiter. It's decided it doesn't want to, so it will go back to Earth if I go in reverse here. And we can see that there's also other satellites involved in it as well. And most of these are scientific satellites or um, like the TDRS tracking data and relay satellites that NASA's put up to communicate with. And we can pop this back into real time. So does anybody have a favorite probe? Cassini. Cassini, okay. We're going to go look at Cassini. So this has every single probe you can think of. They're still building 3D models for some of them, but a lot of the major missions that we're talking about right now do have 3D models of them. So we can go to Saturn. That's where Cassini would be at. So let's go ahead and go to Saturn. So here's Saturn here. We'll wait for it to load. Can you put it in photo mode once you get there? Because that's really pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here is Saturn. And we're going to do natural light with it. So we can see it a little bit better. And it's going to load up that atmosphere there. There we go. So we'll put it into photo mode. You can take photos with it. And photo mode it makes it look very, very pretty. So we can see Saturn there, and we can go around, we can look at Saturn, we can flip it over, we can look at its ring systems, other things like that, but we want to look at Cassini. So we're going to go back to full screen, and we're going to go out of photo mode, and we're going to find Cassini. So Cassini is somewhere around here. I know it is. Where are you, Cassini? There we go. So here is Cassini over here. And this is a very big spacecraft, very detailed models that they put together with them. And we like to, like we said, we like to use this for educational purposes because it really allows you to visualize things with the kids. Because most kids can't really grasp things without being able to see it. And seeing it really helps out. So here's Cassini. And I'm going to go into the visual controls and make it pretty again. So there's Cassini. And we can see Cassini is currently orbiting Saturn on its, is it in the Equinox mission, if I remember correctly? So it's extended mission. So there's Saturn back there. And we can actually look at Cassini. You can see that the Titan probe is missing from it. And we can get in really close and take a look at all of those different sensors that it has on board that allow it to look at Saturn and measure Saturn and all those all the great science that it's doing at Saturn. So does anybody else have another favorite probe that they want to see? Voyager 1. Voyager 1. Excellent. Well, Voyager 1, the farthest thing we've sent anywhere. So we can actually go in here and we can select spacecraft. And that would be an outer planet mission. So let's go look at where Voyager 1 is. So we're going to be heading quite far out here. Now we've got the spacecraft model to load. So the neat thing is when these spacecraft are doing flybys of bodies, they can get very, very close. And then we can actually show that in real time. The other day we were showing Cassini actually going right past one of the moons of Saturn, very, very close to it in real time. And we were able to talk with the kids about uh, discussing why would you fly by that moon and other things like that. So, looking at Voyager 1 here, launched in 1977, a long time ago. 
quite a while ago. It's still going out and continuing to go out and still functioning, which is always great. So here's Voyager, and this is its current orientation, and there's the solar system back there. So this is what Voyager would see if you could see the solar system. So we could see here's the orbit of Neptune right here. This is how far away Voyager is. Very, very far. And then, of course, like we said, it's very, very detailed. When they showed it to us at JPL, we were able to actually look at a life-size Voyager model and that there was a NASA sticker on it that they had, and then that sticker was on it right there up here. The government property NASA sticker right there. So that's how detailed they've gotten with these spacecraft models in here. And of course, this was developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and California Institute of Technology. And here at the Space Center, we like to use it. And we can look at New Horizons, the mission heading out to Pluto. A very great mission. Also launched on the same type of rocket that Juno was launched on yesterday, the Atlas 5551. And here's New Horizons, and it's in spin stabilization, so that's why it's spinning. And we can see that it is currently headed on its way out, and it's past the orbit of Uranus, and it's getting close to the orbit of Neptune, and it's going to be, of course, intercepting Pluto for that flyby in 2015. Now, I wanted to show you one of those flybys that we talked about with Cassini here. This is very, very awesome to actually see those. So let's do a flyby of Enceladus. So it's going to tell me that it's changing its date and time so that it can show me an actual flyby that happened. And we're going to go to that, if it will let me. All right, well, let's, let's try a different flyby real quick. How about when it arrived at Saturn back in 2004? Let's try that. There we go. So it's changing my date right now, and it's setting that up for us to look at it. Do you guys have any questions so far about this program? So it's going to download that model. So of course, Cassini took a quite an interesting flight into Saturn, went over the rings, and then we can actually speed it up to show you one of the great things about this program. As we're waiting for Cassini to load, were there any questions about this program? All right. I so here's. I promise that I use it every single day to take new pictures to post on Twitter. It's yes, awesome. it's very very awesome for those of us that know about it. Well ahead of time. <laughs> it's pretty awesome to play around with it. And of course, it's open to the public for you to go in and use it and take any photos you want, things like that. So here's Cassini at Saturn as it was going. And if we speed this up, we can actually see the actual movement that Cassini made while it was at Saturn. So here it is. It's taking observations of the rings. And then as it went through the rings, it turned around to protect itself from any high-speed particles that may have hit it. And then we can see here that Cassini is continuing away from Saturn. Of course, we're accelerating this pretty immensely here. And here it is probably sending all that information back to Earth. So those are the basics of Eyes on the Solar System 3D. And you can see it's a really great program, especially if you're trying to educate uh, people about the robotic probe missions uh, out in the solar system that NASA, JPL, and ESA runs. And uh, if you folks don't, uh, folks have any more questions? That is the end of the presentation. So, all right. Well, thank you, folks, for coming in and looking at eyes on the solar system with us. Thanks. Mm -hmm.